You are listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's June 3rd. On May 14th, 10 people were shot and killed in a racist attack in Buffalo, New York. Ten days later, a gunman killed 19 children and two teachers at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. And on Wednesday, an assailant carried out yet another deadly mass shooting at a medical building in Tulsa, Oklahoma. These events have reignited the deeply polarized debate about guns in America. Data could help settle these disagreements, says RAND researcher Andrew Morrell. Morrell leads RAND's Gun Policy in America initiative – which seeks to establish a shared set of facts to inform the development of fair and effective gun policies. Since 2016, he and his colleagues have reviewed thousands of scientific articles to identify credible evidence about the effects of different gun laws. Specifically, they looked for evidence that laws caused changes on a wide range of outcomes, including homicides, suicides, and mass shootings. The researchers found strong evidence to suggest that several policies, child access prevention laws, for example, are effective at reducing injuries and death. Inversely, research is persuasive that stand-your-ground laws, which remove the traditional obligation to avoid using deadly force in a conflict if retreat is a safe option, are associated with an increase in firearm homicides. But more often than not, Strong evidence about the effects of gun laws is not available. This reflects an underfunding of gun policy research that has persisted in the U.S. for decades. Importantly, Morrell says that, quote, we should not expect to implement laws only for which we have strong scientific evidence. Policymakers and the public may instead need to rely on logical considerations and weaker evidence. For example, there's mounting evidence that background checks decrease homicides. There's also moderately strong evidence that waiting period laws decrease firearm suicides and homicides. Moderately strong evidence also suggests that laws prohibiting people who have domestic violence restraining orders from owning guns can decrease intimate partner homicides. Of course, Some people who argue about guns are never going to be swayed by scientific evidence about firearms policies. But, says Morrell, many of these arguments involve empirical questions that can be answered with good research. The shooting in Buffalo was carried out by an individual who appears to have been radicalized online, sparking discussion about the Internet's role in stoking extremism and hate. RAND researchers have been studying this problem. They recently developed a scorecard that rates websites and social media platforms based on how receptive they are to extremist content. They considered factors like content policies, awarding extra points to sites that actually enforce them. And on the flip side, points were deducted if sites featured swastikas or other extremist symbols. The sites with the most points, think Facebook or Twitter, landed in a category the researchers called mainstream. That didn't mean that they were free of extremist content, far from it, but that content wasn't their main reason for being. At the other end of the spectrum were niche sites like Stormfront or 8chan, for which spreading extremist content is a core function. There were also sites that fell somewhere in between. The researchers called them fringe sites. They hosted a mix of extremist and non-extremist content, often under the banner of protecting free speech and standing up to what they describe as censorship on mainstream platforms. Some, like Gab, are even designed to look almost exactly like a mainstream site, down to the fonts they use. Rand's Alexandra Evans, who worked on the project, explained that although the sites they looked at varied in how much hateful and violent content they host, Extremist content can be found just about anywhere online. Quote, there's this idea that there's a dark part of the internet, and if you just stay away from websites with a Nazi flag at the top, you can avoid this material. What we found is that this dark internet, this racist internet, doesn't exist. You can find this material on platforms that any average internet user might visit. 
Further, our experts say that most of those who ascribe to violent extremism do not clearly associate themselves with an organized group. And when you combine this with the fact that people can self-radicalize online, preventing violence becomes pretty complicated. Preventing these mass shootings and other violent attacks is another topic that RAND experts have been studying. To identify evidence-based ways to reduce the likelihood of mass attacks and to reduce casualties when they do occur, our researchers recently examined 600 past incidents and plots, interviewed dozens of experts, and reviewed hundreds of references. They used their findings to create a toolkit that can help law enforcement, first responders, school officials, and others learn how to better defend against potential attacks. You can explore the toolkit and find all of our resources on gun policy and online extremism at RAND.org. Today marks 100 days of Russia's war in Ukraine. We'll close out this episode with some insights from our experts on the conflict. Russia has stumbled strategically, operationally, and tactically in Ukraine. It has been hampered by faulty planning, unrealistic timelines, and impractical objectives. It has suffered from inadequate supplies, bad logistics, and insufficient force protection. And it's been impaired by poor leadership. According to Rand's Dara Masakot, these issues are all connected by one underlying theme. Russia's lack of concern for its military personnel. This has been apparent as the Russian military has spent billions of dollars on new equipment, but has not properly treated soldiers' injuries, has struggled to retrieve the bodies of its dead, has obscured its casualties, and has been indifferent toward worried military families. Moscow does not even appear to care tremendously whether its troops are traumatized. Quote, the Russian high command behaves as if its troops are an afterthought, making tactical decisions as if it can simply throw people at poorly designed objectives until it succeeds. This culture of indifference not only lowers morale, but also degrades combat effectiveness. The results are plain to see, says Masakot. Despite Russia's missteps, the war in Ukraine rages on. Moscow has recently stepped up its offensive in the Donbass region, and evidence of atrocities committed by its military continues to mount. Is there a chance for peace? A viable pathway out of the conflict? Rand's Samuel Cherup wrote this week about the best option for eventually ending the war. Back in March, Ukrainian diplomats proposed a framework to deal with Russia. At the center of this deal was a trade, Kyiv would renounce its ambitions to join NATO and embrace permanent neutrality in return for security guarantees from both the West and Russia. If this proposal were to become the basis of an eventual settlement, the result would be a mechanism, however counterintuitive, that would make Russia itself a stakeholder in Ukraine's security. There are many obstacles to such an agreement, Cherub explains, and these obstacles would be exceptionally difficult to overcome. For one, even though Russia would benefit from such a deal, many doubt that Moscow would ever approve it. After all, Russia would be agreeing that if it attacked Ukraine again, it would face a high risk, if not a near certainty, of war with the United States and its allies. And from the Western perspective, Ukraine's neutrality and the ban on foreign bases and exercises that would be part of the agreement would pose particular dilemmas for the U.S. military. The Pentagon's usual approach to ensuring security commitments, such as forward deployments, full access to territory, and some degree of operational planning with partners, would not be possible. Despite all this, Cherup says, the proposal remains the most plausible path toward a sustainable peace for Ukraine. And if it were to succeed, it could also provide a model for other non-aligned states, such as Moldova and Georgia, and even for a new European security architecture one that could potentially improve relations between Russia and the West. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis. For more on today's episode, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We'll see you next week.